Wednesday night. I am going to explain that thumbnail. If you want a YouTube video to go viral, the algorithm insists the first 24 hours matter. If you don't share it, if, it, if people don't like it, if there's not comments on it, in the first 24 hours, it's like you don't exist. And if you want to hack that inside a keto community, you should have a big steak sizzling away or apple cider vinegar and how it tweaks the way two mitochondria speak. And it's some weird thing that is only going to ever help 0.03% of your population. And it doesn't, it's not sustainable. I started this YouTube channel because I was frustrated. I spent time behind an exam room door teaching patients and well, the algorithm behind the exam room door is that if the insurance company doesn't see me ordering a test or a prescription, then they aren't going to pay me. So if I wanted to sandwich the education between the prescription and the order for your labs, well, then I was okay. But there wasn't enough time. And despite the fact that physician means to teach, there was no time for that. And I finally said, forget it. I'll do it for free. I will be on YouTube and at least I get to talk about the things that actually make a difference in the lives of the people that come to talk to me. And I would start doing things like, you can't come see me again until you watch this video. And it would explain the things that there was no time for in the exam room. As I watch and say, all right, I'm not gonna share a food plan ever on my channel. I'm not gonna share a bunch of recipes. I call that food porn. Um, I'm also not going to tell you about some weird things that go in between two mitochondria that make no difference to 99% of all the people watching. But three times in my career, I have done a deep dive into how well people break it. They break the cycle. They stop doing what they've been doing. They stop gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight, and they are done. And it's a terrible business plan because they're healthy. They get off their prescription meds. They do not need me. They're like Grandma Rose. They are better. And it's brilliant, it's so refreshing. But not everybody does that. There are rules, and we call these rules the cycle-breaking rules. And we've been doing the, uh, the first time I did it, I think I had a half a dozen. The second time I did it, my practice was probably, I think it was 2012, and I had about a dozen. And this time, in the last uh, year, looking at the people that break the cycle, We've spent the first five weeks, and tonight we're on the, the final one, where the rules are, number one, if they get tired, they rest, but they don't quit. Number two, they love data, even when they're doing badly. They also know their triggers, and we talked about that. We then said they never arrive. Their short-term goals are leading to their long-term goals, and as soon as the short-term goal is done, they set another one. They never arrive. And last week, we said the title was time to get naked <laughs> and just like orgasm you can't fake this one you need to have a good why and if you don't understand your why if you're faking your why you're gonna you're gonna cycle you're gonna keep doing this but tonight's message it's not gonna get the most clicks but it is the number one reason why people get better and then they don't need me anymore they are done they are on their way to the best health of their life before we do that, uh, I, am, I have some announcements. Uh, as you can see, I am in the wild again this week. It's our final week of Keto in the Wild, which means that our uh, system, uh, or our, our summer, not system, of taking a break and showing you that when you're keto in the wild, here's some hacks that I do. Here's some things that I've done. Um, and trying to show you the different locations around Tampa and around what is my new home, not South Dakota. Um, and how much that has really helped me become part of this community. Uh oh, oh, I got some, there you go. Uh, become par part of this community. And um, some of that has been, here are my numbers, that I fast every week 
and the fasting has led to a blood sugar of 72 and ketones of 1.8. Um, and the, the fasting used to begin on Sundays, but now it begins on, um, it still begins on Sundays, but I used to do my live on Sunday. And now I start on Sunday, but I do my live at the end of the fast. And sometimes I fast until the next day, but I am going to have some pucker up in my bubble water tonight. And then I'll do my best to not forget my numbers at the end of the show. Um, a couple other other announcements. When I am in the office and I'm doing a little more didactic le le lessons on Tuesday night, I like those, but they, ha they take a lot more work. Um, and I have my laptop. <laughs> so I'm going to trust you to do a couple of things that are really good for the channel. They help me continue to do this for free, uh, which is uh, go to the Dr. Boz favorites page on uh, Boz MD. So that's B O Z M D dot com. Uh, you'll notice at the top of the page there is a sign up for the keto secrets that we send out every week. It's a weekly email that we're just trying to do a better job of communicating what's going on in our business and our in our our community. Um, and it is personal. It's about some of the things I've learned, some of the things patients tell me. Um, you'll also notice that when you're on the page, there'll be a pop up, and the pop up is to sign up for the master class that is a big announcement that we are doing this month. Um, if you've been following us, you'll know that uh, the two biggest events of the year for our business is the 21 day metabolic kick. It's when, well, it's when everyone on my team gets a little healthier. It's when I get a little healthier. It's when I hack and really take care of a habit. And then I have these amazing coaches and the coaches are meant to be people just like you. They are grandmas and moms and teachers and sisters and, um, you know, working, you know, airline um, coordinators. <laughs> and they have a keto success story. And I'm trying to show you that you can teach other people keto. You do not need letters behind your name. Um, there are several of them that are that usually watch on Tuesday night. So I'm just going to say a quick hello. Um, and um, Inside that 21 day metabolic kick, we know that we, we're gonna talk more about that in the future weeks, but we are explaining that in the emails that are coming out in the next couple of weeks. And we know those are for the hardcore keto people who really wanna do the Dr. Boz uh, method in the most intense way. But we have a lot of new people on the channel in the last couple of weeks, a couple of months, and we are doing a free masterclass for them. So if you want a quick, you know, catch up, uh, catch up to what the rest of us are talking about. Uh, there's something that I usually only teach inside that class and I teach it to the newbies, but I decided to make that for free in the master class because we just have a lot of people that do not understand this very well and they haven't read the book and they haven't taken it, they, they just haven't been invested. So it's like the cliff notes of saying, if you're trying to teach anyone and you're frustrated with the questions, send them to this free master's class. You will love it. You will love it. You will love it. Um, so it not only helps people really kind of catch up to what, how we talk on this channel, but it'll answer the questions that I think, well, most people are surprised by. Um, all right. Another couple things. I will be in, uh, Louisville on October 6th through the 8th. I was just reviewing that one of my favorite, uh, speakers, uh, Ryan Lowry is also on stage with me and he's another science geek that is just does a great job with community, great job at educating. He's a PhD in um, exercise physiology. And just, I love the studies he puts out about the ketogenic diet. I love how he helps athletes do the best job with a ketogenic diet. But in Louisville, if you want to come hang out with me, come to Keto Palooza. But even if you just want to check out the page, I'm trying to send a signal to my friend who's running this. Her name is Autumn. So if you go to the Dr. Boz favorites page, click on that link to get there. Because in the URL, in the, the website address, it says, hey, Dr. Boz sent me. The other friend you'll find on that page is my friend um, Mindy Peltz, who, Dr. Mindy. And she has a big program going on this week that also has really great speakers. And I think the price is right this week. I think it's free this week. Um, but then after next week, it's, there's a charge to it. So if you are looking for some awesome lectures that are in a pretty organized way, Mindy and her team are, they're in the space and doing well, and I want to show her my support as well. 
the final thing is if you have uh, watched the data is your friend one where I, I, I shared that my son, the 20 year old, has been knocking on doors as a door to door salesman in Chicago. Uh, it's his last week to do that. And I love, oh, I love him, but I, I really love how hard he's been working. And I tried to do a nice thing for him, which is to say, if anybody on my channel is looking for a home security, I told him I would keep that up on my favorites page uh, until the end of next week. So if you have any curiosity about home security, and if you have, if you're a mom with kids out there trying hard, I would love it for anybody that clicks on there and listens to what he's up to. Um, and that is my shout out to my son. So let's get back to the lesson, the most important lesson of these six. Uh, and this lesson is not going to uh, rank on the highest level for people clicking. Um, my team was like, oh, you cannot do this topic. You have to change it. Nobody clicks on this. Uh, we lose the algorithm game. It's awful. I'm like, no, it's not. It's the only one that actually matters. And it has to do with brains. It has to do with how brains function in the real world. That when you are homo sapien, when you are a human and you want to learn something, you do it differently when you're in the primary age than you are when you're a teenager, this rapid growth of your brain, versus when you're an adult after the age of 26. Uh, that's adult for brains. Those three stages of learning have different styles of how the brain captures information and puts it in a place that you can find it in the future. That when you are a, uh, in primary school, seeing and activity are absolutely required to learn. That when you get to teenage years, you can take a book uh, and didactics and you can apply them as long as there is action in front of you. But if you haven't learned something by the age of 26 and you want to learn it, uh, it must be linked to emotion. It must have an emotional content to it or specifically behavior change will not stick. You will stay in the cycle that they keep repeating it over and over and over again. There is a special cell in your brain called a mirror neuron that's in charge of this that we know Primates have them, we have them, there aren't other brains that have them. And you must activate these mirror neurons in order to learn. You can find another, I've done this video a couple times, I think it's awesome, I love talking about it, but it's one of those brain geeky things that if I have some slides and show you the brains, it turns out much better. The reason I'm bringing it up now is that today we did a check-in in my um, support group where I said, all right, if you have behaviors that you learned as a child and now they're causing you health problems and you want to change them, you must learn that error and then a new way with other people in front of you. You have to learn it by, by mirroring someone in front of you. And I said, well, let me show you uh, by a couple stories about me, I, I'll tell you one, I told a couple this morning, uh, how, of how I, I know one of the first adult things I learned, and it was requiring a mirror neuron. Uh, again, mirror neurons are that part where you don't know you're really not learning as a teenager because you sit down with your family, you have supper at night, uh, you eat the food, and afterwards you clean up the table and you put the dishes in the dishwasher, and then you move on to this other segment in the night but your meals had a fork and it had a plate and it had sitting down and it had your parents in front of you. That rhythm of eating is in your mind as normal if you did it as a child, if you did it as a teenager. If you never did that, you're gonna have to have somebody show you that this is the pattern of how you eat in a way that doesn't overeat. So I had that upbringing, that wasn't something I needed to learn. Um, I was in the first few years of my marriage and I'm a firstborn female. Uh, I'm the firstborn in my family. My husband is the firstborn in his family. And from the very first encounter, we did a great job of fighting. We now think it's foreplay. <laughs> That's just how we work. That we are very intense, uh, 
but it's part of the attraction that the intensity is matched. And well, we were we were in a Bible study and we were headed to Bible study or we were we were fighting. This was not uncommon, but we, we learned that Bible study, <laughs> we scared away some couples, but the, the couples we were with this time liked, didn't like it. They, they understood us and we showed up to Bible study and we were, we were mad. And I was right and he was wrong and I was right and he was wrong, period. And so we were chirping at each other <laughs> during Bible study and uh, one of the other couples says, well, um, well, we're fighting. And so then they start doing their chirping. And now we've got two couples fighting in Bible study. <laughs> and the family leading it said, all right, let's do something uh, a little more constructive. So we're going to have, the other couple went first. We're going to have you just say this. And then they practiced just doing a little bit better communication. And I was waiting. It was my turn. It was going to be our turn. And I wasn't listening to anything they were saying. I was like, here's what I'm going to say. And if he says this, I'm going to say that. And, and I, I know I'm right. He is going to listen to me. This is absolute. I am right. I was so intense. And it came to our turn. And they gave the baton to my husband first. And I wanted it. I was, so I was, I was ready to bite. Like, arr. And my husband said these words. He goes, honey, you're right. I'm wrong. And I was shocked. I know everything I was going to say went out my, my mind. I couldn't think of anything because I was like, what? Here's this guy who I'm madly in love with because he fights with me. And he just said something that I, I'm, I'm really struggling to process. And two days later, I'm still thinking about this moment where I, it took my breath. I mean, I can think of the moment because, and I get goosebumps because I'm like, no, no, no. What was shocking to me, years later I realized a mirror neuron was activating in my brain because I had never seen that. In my family of origin, you either fought it out or you disappeared until you were done being mad but you never said, you're right, I'm wrong. And I'm like 30 years old. And I keep thinking over the next couple of days, I'm like, why, why have I never said those words? I don't even know if I know how to say those words. And a mirror neuron was activating. I was learning a behavior that I still have to work hard to use. I, I told this story in my support group this morning. They say, did you ever say it again? <laughs> I said, yeah, I did. I had to learn to say it to my kids. I've had to learn to say it to my staff. But the first person I practiced with was this man I trust a lot. And he demonstrated something that I didn't know. I learned an adult behavior because someone modeled it to me. So the check-ins this morning at the support group I learned a couple other stories. The check-ins were, tell me something that you learned when you were in community with somebody else. It can be at the support group. It can be at a stitch and bitch. It could be at a Bible study. It can be at a keto support, support summit, whatever. And so this woman who is super smart, been coming to our group for over a year. I love her, but she has some blind spots. I mean, we all do, but it's really easy for me to see her blind spots. She's a professional. She sees, you know, she consults for people and, and she's very smart. But when it comes to losing weight, it's like she has blinders on. And over the last, um, <laughs> the last um, nine months, because I, I, she's probably been coming for 18 months. I don't know. She's been coming for a long time. I see this pattern she keeps doing and I was doing something I told, I mean, I have rules that are inside a support group and one of the rules are you should not tell people what to do. You should tell about your own experience. So let me tell you this woman. So she, she has been struggling and she would fall off the wagon and fall off the wagon. And over the last nine months, I kept saying, just eat sardines. Just take everything else off the menu for three days, eat sardines. And she would do it for a little while and then she wouldn't 
and she would do it for a little while and, she, and I was of course telling her what to do and not following my own rule. And when I asked people to check in, she raised her hand and I said, tell me your, your story. And she said, I was at this Orlando Keto Summit this past uh, two weeks and I met a man who is just like me. He said that if he has a thimble full of carbohydrates for the next day, he craves food. He wants more food. That it's just that tiny amount of carbohydrates that sends him spiraling into a constant craving for food. And she goes, so he's carnivore. And I keep thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I've been telling you to do. But I didn't say it like that. And she goes, so I was carnivore for the week after Keto, um, keto Orlando Summit. And it was great. I, I couldn't believe the freedom. I, my, I just didn't have any of those cravings. I was back on track. And then I had a thimble full of broccoli. She goes, it's good for you. It's vegetables. But, you know, it's not on carnivore. So, but I did it. And for the next day, I craved carbs. I craved food. I just wanted food. He was right. He's just like me. And the man that was speaking to her was, a, was about her age or maybe even a little older. And he had struggled and struggled and then he didn't. And when he talked to her, he, he activated her mirror neurons. She could see her flaw in his story. And the emotion of that connected her. And my knuckleheaded way of saying, do this, just follow my instructions. And even when I would put it on a prescription pad or I would order it <laughs> as a doctor, and say, this is what you need to do. They would, they would do this, they would cycle, they would fall, they would come back. And you're like, oh my goodness, how many times are we gonna visit this story? And it was because I wasn't using mirror neurons to teach that woman. And this man did a way better job than me. She's like, I just need to be carnivore. I'm like, great, I could go through the science and say, you know why you have cravings? It's because you're insulin resistant and you put those carbohydrates in and it shoots up your insulin and then your insulin overproduces because you're insulin resistant and then your carbs go crashing down. And when it's that crashing down is when you have the craving and that's what's gonna keep you activating and wanting food for about 24 hours. Doesn't matter, she doesn't care. All she knows is that a thimble full of carbohydrates sent him over the edge and that's her too. And the story is what activated her. So then there was another check-in that was probably my favorite. It was my favorite actually. And I call it the Cuban guilt story. So there's this woman in my support group and from the very beginning, she's been one of my favorites and she's been my helper. So she comes every week to help set up the chairs and then when I have to rush off to the next meeting, she answers questions for people and she creates the community. And she's wonderful. She is a first generation Cuban American and she has this huge Cuban family. And on the weekends, their family gathers and they celebrate every weekend with food and alcohol. And she goes, yeah, I'd been keto for a while and I was coming to your keto support group and I realized everybody at the family reunions looks the same. They all have these health problems. And the health problems aren't a little bit that we are all getting the same ones and we're getting them pretty quickly. And she said, so I was coming to support and I was, she was perfect. She didn't break a rule. She was on track. She was losing weight and then she failed. Then she fell off and she's my helper. So she still came to group, uh, but she would say, I'm not keto. I'm just not keto. I'm not keto. And I'm like, it's okay. Just keep coming. And around the room, she would see other people that were struggling and failing and then, and then they'd get back on track. And then they'd struggle and fail and then they'd get back on track. So it had been weeks, probably months, that she was off of the keto wagon, but still coming to group. And she said, I noticed these people, well, I, I actually was, was feeling that it's this guilt of failing that is, that is heavy for me. And I said, well, how did you see the guilt in the other people? And she goes, well, I really saw the opposite of that. I saw how they forgave themselves. She saw grace. And it was through that where she said, I must not have a great example of that 
at this stage of my life or I just can't seem to, to give that to myself. And when she saw the other people failing and saying, I know, I screwed it up, but I'm going to try again. Well, then she tried again. And she screwed it up and tried again and screwed it up and tried again. And every time she's done that over the last two, almost two years now, she says, the first time I was perfect for the longest time, and I call it white knuckling. They can just hold on and be really like a, well, I, I call it a dry drunk. They might not be drinking alcohol, but they are not happy people. And then she crashed. And then she's like, I'm not doing that again. I'll be your helper, but I'm not doing it again. And then she had enough examples where she tried again. And the second time around, well, she stayed on longer without so much intensity of, of just talking negative to herself. And then she failed again. But this time, it was a shorter trip in the ditch. And the next time, it's a shorter trip in the ditch. And now she's in this steady rhythm where she's like, I'm just so much nicer about when I screw it up. And not this, you know, expected failure that, okay, but perfection is never what we're after. But because she didn't have good examples of that in her primary years, or maybe her teenage years, she she needs other human, other people in her community to show her through a mirror neuron how that looks. And that, my friends, is the number one way, the most important of these six rules to break a cycle is to stop, uh, stop a cycle. You must stay connected to community members. You also must keep learning. That learning involves watching a behavior, and then relaxing when this happens. Because when, when it goes off, people call it an aha moment. I'm like, yeah, it's aha, but it'll be about two days before you really realize what aha means. So I, uh, am, I am super excited about how we're going to continue over the next six months to bring up some cycle-breaking behaviors but it is these six core foundations that if I could take it out of my brain and put it into all the patients I've seen that I didn't do it right, or even all the patients who show up on a YouTube channel on a random Tuesday to say, it's keto in the wild, it's not a didactic lecture, you're not going to get a bunch of slides, but it, it is truly the most important lesson where if you want to stop doing this up and down thing, you cannot be isolated. You need to be in community and having a support group. And if you don't know how to make one of those, we know how to help you. And then we don't charge you. We say, no, no, the way you win is you're in control of this. We pass the responsibility to you. That's all coming up in future visits or future um, um, places. I won't bore you with that, but I will take questions because we have, um, oh good, we're in very good timing here actually. So I'm going to have um, the final one is people stay connected and they keep learning. And we will make that a, you will see that in the email this Friday. I do want your questions. So if you've got your questions in, I'm going to have my team. Um, oh, there is a pinned right now was on the masterclass. So if you've been watching what we pinned there, I will have my team pin the next question, which they've got hopefully waiting in the, in the background there. Um, yeah, I'm looking at other folks saying, yeah, it's the keto support groups that really do uh, have uh, ha help their sustainability too. But yeah, uh, so Busha Busha, I see there too. Very much a big part of our show. I'm waiting to see if our team can pin um, the next one. Or if you see a good one, I can, this one right here. Okay, I'm going to read this one by... Um, a question. A lot of the keto gurus out there talk a lot about leptin and cortisol. Are those important? This is written by Lorraine W. And I'll, I'll have them uh, pin that uh, question for future. But uh, leptin and cortisol. Cortisol uh, being very much uh, the foundation and the enemy uh, of high blood sugars. Like if you are trying to get that blood sugar below 100 in the morning, which 
I contend is the only way you ever actually lose the weight forever is your morning fasting before you wake up. Uh, I mean, I, CGM's here. Uh, that morning fasting blood sugar must be below 100. If it's not, you're not gonna lose weight. Now, people can lose weight higher than that, but it will be only for a short phase and you will plateau. The sustainable weight loss is at a glucose of lower than 100. And when people say, Doc, I just can't get it to be below 100. I mean, I love it when they wear CGMs, uh, continuous glucose monitors, because it is a, 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 a wave of swing and up and down of their emotions that causes their blood sugars to go high. So I have one of my followers who said, yeah, whenever I would watch the news, my blood sugars would go high. And I said, well, how did you fix that? And she said, I stopped watching the news. I'm like, well, that's not how it works. The ability to regulate your stress, because what will come along the next time is something else is gonna stress you out. And it's that burst of cortisol that raises those blood sugars. And if you're trying to have weight loss that's sustainable, you got to do the real thing. You actually have to unpack the psychology of this weight loss. As much as I'm a science geek and I really like it to be analytical and I like it to be a black and white answer, it's this touchy-feely stuff that will keep that cortisol high. So the, the woman asked, is cortisol important? Super important. Um, I, I always love the question, how well is cortisol compared to, uh, or what, what is the other enemy of cortisol when it comes to hormones? Um, I should wait to give everybody a chance um, uh, to answer that. Um, what's the opposite of cortisol? I'm going to talk about leptin while you guys answer that. Um, it's, it's not glucose. I want to know the opposite hormone, not, not the opposite molecule. What's the opposite hormone of cortisol? I mean, it's the yin and yang to cortisol. Uh, leptin is, um, is known as one of those um, hormones that also suppresses appetite. If you have high leptin, or what, what, what's a better way to say it is very sensitive leptin, your leptin is communicating correctly to those fat cells. Uh, leptin, they're lean. Um, the lean growth of, um, you know, of muscle mass is, uh, is abundant in people with high leptin phases. Um, but just like insulin, leptin becomes resistant. When the fat cells become overwhelming, it's hard for leptin to hear anything anymore, and all the leptin in the world is not going to help that lean muscle mass continue to grow to use those fat cells. Um, so several of you, uh, actually M-A-G-O-O-814 got it right. Melatonin is the opposite of cortisol. When, when cortisol rises, uh, melatonin is not going to rise. If you want cortisol to, if you want melatonin to rise, you've got to take down cortisol. Uh, of course, melatonin very important for how our brain shuts down, how we rest, how we restore, and you know one of the biggest enemies of melatonin is is light into your eye. Uh, so our screens are, are a big enemy there. Um, Marcelino Gomez writes in and says, "How many grams of protein should be consumed per day?" Well, I will tell you, I've written about that in my book, and I can send you to read about it because it, it is pocketed in a place that I don't like to focus on the protein, mainly because when people are focused on the protein, uh, they're missing a few other steps. Um, when I hear people saying, I'm eating 1.2 milligrams uh, uh, or grams of protein for every kilogram of of lean muscle mass that I have, I think, wow, you're spending way too much energy on a section of advanced exercise physiology, something my friend Ryan Lowry would spend a lot of time on. But he is working with advanced athletes who do not need to lose fat mass. Most people like Marcelino, I'm going to guess, are hoping to lose fat mass. And when they're trying to lose fat mass, what's almost always sabotaging them is excess insulin. So if you want to lower insulin, anytime you masticate, masticate, chew, that's gum, that's TikToks, that's protein, that's eggs, that's fat, that's carbs, really high with carbs. And then the, the smaller the particle size, all of those burst insulin. If you are insulin resistant, that insulin resistance doesn't allow 
you to make a little bit of insulin, it has sent, you make buckets of insulin. Uh, those buckets of insulin happen every time the signal of mastication is occurring. So they say, doc, I'm overeating protein. I'm turning it all into carbs. I'm like, quit focusing on the protein and focus on two boluses of food. Now look up the word bolus. It's a dollop, it's a session. I don't say two snacks, I don't say two meals, I say two volumes of food. That's the, you know, stick with those. And in between, put nothing. And on the other sides, put nothing. So that the food hits in eight hours. And then maybe you take it to six hours. And then maybe you take it to five hours. And if that's as tight as you can get your two boluses of food, now move them more towards sunrise. Away from sunset, towards sunrise. How close? I don't know. What is your morning fasting glucose the next morning? If the morning glucose is greater than 100, uh, you need less insulin. Quit thinking about protein and think about two boluses of high fat, low carb food, like a can of sardines or a steak. I mean, the, the, the protein consumption is, is a distraction for most people with insulin resistance. They, they need less volume of food, which you cannot do until you replace those hormones in your body yeah, that's why I do the keto continuum, because now I'm answering like four questions in one scenario, saying, well, if you're this, then you're that. If you're this, then you're that. So when it comes to protein consumption, I highly recommend you go read or listen to the book, Keto Continuum. It is a story about a man who was never my patient, but he showed up to the support group. And luckily, he made every mistake known to mankind on the ketogenic diet and became a great teachable moment for everyone. <laughs> And the story of him is how you will learn all these things. Um, so the audiobook on that is great. I would highly recommend you buy the workbook so you can write your numbers in the workbook. Um, yeah, Nancy Griffith says, I fell off the wagon hard for 10 days about six days ago. Uh, how long before I can fast longer than 18 hours? I tried, but glucose was all over the place. Stopped after two days, yeah. So. Nancy, it will depend on how good you were before you fell off. So if they've been, let's take my, my, my guilty Cuban, the lady who fell off and then got back on, and then fell off and got back on. So she's also noticed that when she has a mistake, uh, you cannot go back to fasting. It's like asking somebody who is out of shape to run a marathon. I need you to be step by step, carefully doing the next steps and really containing a skill set before you advance to the next one. It's like saying the third grader should be hopping into the 12th grade. Uh, the third grader needs to master the third grade skills and then the fourth grade skills and then the fifth grade skills. And that's why the keto continuum really works there. So what I like to see is that in the keto continuum, they hung out at that two boluses of food, that's keto continuum number four, long enough that when they fall, they can go back to this. Two boluses of food. That means there's nothing in between the two meals. There's no snacks. There's no peanuts. There's no pistachios. There's no carnivore crisps. It's two boluses of food happen during the day. And then outside that boluses of food, there's nothing. There's no extra. It's nothing is going past your parotid glands during mastication to stimulate insulin. And you would need to do that for a solid two weeks and not a fake two weeks. Like in the workbook, you can see, here was my first bite. Here's my second, you know, here's the end of that. Here's the second time I ate, and here's when I got done. And that those stayed within eight hours. And you did that for two weeks, even if it's your birthday. 20 total carbs, and you follow the rules for two weeks. Because guess what? By two weeks, you got a pattern going. And now we can take a little bit of shift, and we can habit stack. We can add a little bit of behavior change there. That when they first go keto, they do. They rip the Band-Aid off, and they do great. But after they fall the first time, or the second time, or the third time, I say, no, 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 now stop doing this thingy. Stop doing this mess. And hold tight with two boluses of food within eight hours for two weeks without screwing it up. So that means if you get to day 13 and you screw it up, the, t the timer starts over. Without that, you're gonna fall again. And even if you do, it's okay. You can come back and we'll help you again. <laughs> mm. So I see this one by uh, um, Amiel, 
uh, C Chan. He says, every time I go on the keto diet, I get a rash. It's called the keto rash. I've done a few videos on that. It's very itchy. It doesn't necessarily show up in the same place twice. And when the keto rash, the keto rash um, gets biopsied by dermatologists, uh, they look under the microscope, they send them to the pathology, they grow them in augers of trying to figure out what is this? And it is like a little fungus that loves carbs. And when you take the carbs away and you lower the blood sugar and you lower the insulin, the, the little rash gets crabby. But when you give it a little carbs, the rash goes away. So you'll see people saying, Doc, I can't do the keto diet. I get this rash. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You're letting the little critters in under your skin win. And no, you're not weird. All of us have that under on our skin or in our in our bodies. But with a keto rash, it's been there a long time. It's um it's it's not gonna go away until you take away its food source. And the food source is highly linked to uh, uh, how frequently you give it carbohydrates. <laughs> so if you can stay the course, the next time you get the keto rash, I would say 72 hours of sardines and you will be on the other side of that. But it's a hell of a 72 hours because people itch and it's awful. And just know the critters are winning. They are dividing and that's why you're suffering so much. All right. Um, I think... I don't have another one pinned, do I? Oh, I do, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. Oh, no, I don't. Okay, well, I, um, uh, do, you think, do you see one pinned on there, Jack? Nope, I don't think there's any more pinned. Okay, well, so we're going to sign off. Here's a few things. Please, please sign up those, for those keto secrets on our website. And um, I will tell you, anybody who clicks on my son's page, I really just say from one mom to the next, I, I can't help him in any other way but to say, here's what I can do for you, Walker. <laughs> He's only going to do it for a couple more weeks, and then he'll be back at college at KU. So I'm praying for all the kids that are back at school this week. Uh, we'll see you next week, everybody. Signing off.